Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. In 1974, New York had a problem that didn't seem to want to go away. No matter where you rode on the subway in New York, there was graffiti painted both inside and outside the trains. Young men with their spray cans covered the city trains with their version of art, and soon the subway came to be seen as a symbol of the city on its way to the gutter. So the city put up some security fences, They put razor wire, they brought in guard dogs. They even went through one amazingly misguided strategy to paint all the trains white. Sure enough, the great white fleet, as they called it, was soon covered with a fresh layer of graffiti. The city couldn't think of any way to solve the graffiti problem. Then along came David Gunn. In 1984, Gunn was appointed the president of the New York City Transit Authority. Gunn had a track record of cleaning up subways in Boston and Philadelphia. Even so, the city of New York had been battling the graffiti problem for over a decade. What radical idea could Gunn implement that would turn back the clock to better times? As it turned out, Gunn's solution centered around a single idea. The moment a train was bombed with graffiti, it was to be pulled and painted. So they always pulled it over and they repainted it. If a train car was being repaired, they'd ensure the car remained graffiti-free. If they found graffiti on the train overnight, the New York Transit Authority would sweep in and repaint the train. Even during rush hour, if they found a train had been bombed, they would pull it back to the yard, clean it up, and the graffiti was nowhere to be seen. On May 12, 1989, the city declared victory over the graffiti artists. Notice what just happened? You started reading this article to find out how to write the first 50 words, but before you knew it, you were transported back to New York to the subway and to the graffiti dilemma. And the reason why you got to this point is because of the drama created by the first 50 words. When your article, your presentation, your webinar, when it has this powerful opening, the client gets pulled along happily. And yet, it's not always easy to know how to go about creating those first 50 words. So today, let's look at three ways to create the drama. Method 1. The power of the story. Method 2. Disagreement with your premise. And method 3. Lists. Let's start with the first one, which is the power of the story. In the 1980s, a persistent drought swept through the African savanna. Watering holes dried up. Food was scarcer than ever before, and yet one animal, the kudu, wasn't affected as much. This is because the kudu can continue to get its nutrition from the hardy acacia tree. Most animals don't tend to tangle with the acacia's thorns, but the kudu navigates its way between the thorns to get at the juicy leaves. But suddenly, dozens of kudu started dropping dead. When they were examined, there seemed to be no reason for their deaths. They looked perfectly healthy. They didn't seem to be suffering from any sort of malnutrition. However, the number of deaths soon soared into hundreds and then thousands. 
Now we may believe that Africa is one vast open area, but in reality, a lot of wildlife lives in vast ranches. While it was devastating for the ranchers to see the kudu fall to the ground in heaps, they were also puzzled by the inconsistency of the deaths. On one ranch, the kudu continued to thrive. On other ranches, their numbers decreased precipitously. There seemed to be no answer to the question until they considered the number of kudu on the ranches. On some ranches, there were a lot of kudu. On others, there were a lot less. As the drought raged on, the kudu had no other vegetation but acacia leaves. Once the tree lost all its leaves, it would no longer be able to harness sunlight. In effect, the acacia trees would die. In an act of self-preservation, the trees started producing more tannin. Not just more tannin, but lethal amounts of it. Biologist and African herbivore expert, Professor Van Hoven, examined the rumen of the kudu. He found that the digestive system was in complete shutdown. Now, tannin is a compound and it can only come from a natural source. So it wasn't hard to point fingers at the acacia tree. On the ranches with dense kudu populations, the acacia tree was producing 400% more tannin. The tannin was getting inside the digestive system and killing the kudu. In effect, the acacia trees were culling the kudu. On the ranches with sparser kudu, the tannin wasn't anywhere close to these lethal amounts. The plant was clearly going through a stage of self-preservation. What you just heard was a story. Story, it seems, is easily the fastest way to get a client's attention. And we all know this fact of attention getting to be true, but we aren't sure where to find the stories or how to make them work. And then finally, how to reconnect them to the article. Those are the elements in themselves. So let's start with finding the stories. I tend to find my stories all around me but that's not a good enough answer for you, then here are a few links. You can go to smithsonian.com, lifescience.com, history.com, bbcearth, or listverse.com. In effect, what you need to do is to go to any of these sites, spend some time reading, and then save whatever you need to Evernote. Of course, I keep harping repeatedly that without Evernote, you're just wasting your time. I can literally find hundreds of stories in a few minutes precisely because of Evernote. Finding stories was a bit of a nightmare at first, but I soon realized I could find two or three stories a day that related to history or geology or biology and all these business case studies. Added to that were my own personal stories. And so the first problem was done and dusted, that first problem of finding stories. If I could find three stories a day, I'd have about 21 stories by the following week. And no matter how prolific or speaker I turn out to be, I could go through that volume of stories. But how do you know that these stories are going to work? You have to look for the unfolding ups and downs. The most boring story is one that stays on a single track. It either goes up and stays up, or it goes down and stays down. A good story is like the kudu story. It started out with the drought, it went to the fact that the kudu didn't care and neither did the ranchers. Then the kudu on one ranch started dying, yet the next ranch with fewer kudu had no problem. So then the biologist comes in, he investigates, and now we have a killer. The acacia tree itself. The act of self-preservation. So that story, it has bounced all the way, as do most good stories. You probably have noticed that same bounce for the New York subway story. How the situation went from bad to worse, until David Gunn comes in and he puts an end to the graffiti. 
Stories make a dramatic start to every article. You know how to find these stories now and you know how to store them in Evernote. You can even find the bounce in the stories. What remains is how to connect them to your main content. Notice how I finished the Kudu story? The last line was about self-preservation. So what would the theme of the article be? Sure, self-preservation. But what if the last line was about speedy response? Well, then the article would be about speedy response. That last line of your story, whatever you happen to choose, is what creates the bridge towards the rest of the article. The first port of call should always be a story. It should be an analogy. When you go to Amazon.com and when you read the reviews of the Brain Audit, which is the book that I've written, you will find that most of the readers seem to agree on one fact. Many of them seem to suggest that the Brain Audit is exceedingly easy and refreshing to read. But what is it that makes it so refreshing? Or rather, what makes content boring? It's clearly the lack of stories and analogies. You can't turn more than two or three pages in the Brain Audit without running into stories and analogies. This three-month vacation podcast has at least three stories or analogies, and sometimes there are six or seven. Articles, webinars, reports, they all have stories, they all have analogies. To get your article going, you need to start storing stories. You need to start looking for these ups and downs. And then it's a matter of reconnecting by inserting that last line into the story so that it reconnects with the article. But stories are just one way of taking on the first 50 words. The second method is to disagree with your headline. Let's find out what it means to disagree with your headline. In 1949, the ad agency DDB had a reasonably big challenge. They were given the opportunity to sell the Volkswagen Beetle. This wasn't just another car, it was a post-war German people's car. It was connected all the way back to Hitler himself. Plus, the car was small, it was slow, it was considered to be ugly. Added to this challenge was the fact that DDB had a paltry advertising budget. It was just 800000 So how do you create instant drama when the odds are stacked against you? You simply disagree with your premise. You disagree with your headline. Or in the case of Volkswagen, the thoughts of the day. They disagreed with whatever was happening back in 1949. Because back in 1949, the war had ended and overblown consumption was the order of the day. American cars were big, bulky, and drank tons of fuel. All the advertising pointed to how fast most American cars happened to be. All except Volkswagen, that is. One of their earliest ads took almost everyone by surprise, it said presenting America's slowest fastback. And the ads talked about how the cars wouldn't go over 72 miles per hour, even though the speedometer showed a top speed of 90. What Volkswagen Beetle advertising did was create intense drama by disagreeing with the status quo. The very same principle applies to your article writing, and it gives you the clue as to what you should be doing as well. To snap your audience out of whatever they're doing, it's a good idea to disagree with the prevailing situation, to disagree with the idea. And since you're the one who wrote the headline, what better way to move ahead than to disagree with your own headline? Let's take an example. Let's say your headline says, how to increase prices without losing customers. You'd think the article would continue in the vein of increasing prices, wouldn't you? But instead, it goes the other way. 
The first paragraph instructs you to reduce your prices in half. Then it says reduce it further down to a quarter. And then the text goes on to explain something you're already aware of, that reducing prices is a very bad strategy. However, the technique it uses is what gets your attention. Instead of going in the direction you'd expect, it moves in quite the opposite direction. Disagreement works because of the mild shock. And it also creates this curiosity. You want to figure out what's happening. Why is it going in the opposite direction? But it's one thing to examine an ad or an existing article. How do you create this disagreement in your own articles? Let's start off with a headline. Let's say they are called the three keys to a perfect Ayurvedic diet. Now, how do you disagree with this headline? How do you disagree with it in your first paragraph? Start by thinking how you could sabotage the perfect Ayurvedic diet. Did you get an idea yet? Well, all you need to think up is your headline and then you think of the exact opposite behavior. Let's try another headline, shall we? Let's say the headline is how to get your projects done using an unknown system of time management. And then let's disagree with the headline. Your first paragraph will read like this. Time management is an erroneous concept, which is why most of us struggle to get anything done. Haven't you gone through whole days where you've had loads of time, but still fail to get anything done? That's because we don't really work with time. We work with energy instead. See what's happening? You're pushing in a headline that seems to talk about one thing, but the opening paragraph seems to disagree. But you don't have to keep the disagreement going. After you've made your point in a paragraph or so, you can go back to the original premise of the article. You've completed your mission. You've woken up your audience with the disagreement and they're keen to read more of what you have to say. We've finished two parts. So far we've looked at stories, we've looked at disagreeing with your premise or your headline, but there is a third way that's really helpful when you're feeling, oh, I don't know how to start this article, I'm completely blank. And this method is called the list method. Let's find out how we start articles with lists. Yes, that's right, I said lists. Let's start off with one type of list. The Netherlands, 70%, USA, 30%, UK, 30%. Okay, so let's take another list. A bucket, a spoon, two ladles of chocolate ice cream. These are both examples of lists. And lists get your attention, especially when you use it in the first 50 words. In case you're wondering, the first list, that 70%, 30%, 30%, that comprised of the Netherlands, USA and UK, and it was a description of social trust. In the Netherlands, seven out of 10 people trust each other, in the US and UK, only 3 out of 10 people seem to have social trust. However, we're not here to debate the issue of social trust. What we're looking at is the power of lists. The power of lists when used in the first 50 words of your article. The moment you slide in a list, the reader is intrigued. And rightly so, because it's a sequence of elements and somehow that sequence needs to end up in some logical place. So if your headline was how to get a business up and running in 90 days, you could start your article with a list. That list immediately catches the attention of the reader and it keeps that attention as you transition over to the main article. Lists don't need much preparation. Unlike a story that needs all that bounce and mystery, a list is almost sterile in its approach. You don't even need any disagreement in a list. If anything, a list seems to take the reader right to where they want to go, just like a recipe. And that's why lists are so cool, but there is a downside. Lists are so spartan that they stand out. If you've used a list to start up an article recently, you're probably going to have to wait 
to use that list again or to use a list in your article at all. The very format is so conspicuous that it requires a good deal of time to pass before you can reuse the technique in another article, in another podcast, in another presentation. Nonetheless, they are very good starting points. And if you're in a tricky situation, don't break your head. Just start with the list. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. What did we learn so far? In this very episode, we ran into the story of the New York subway, the kudu on the African savanna, and the story of the Volkswagen Beetle being introduced to America in 1949. Stories are easily the best tool to get the attention of your readers within the first 50 words. It's what I use consistently in books, from the brain audit to dartboard pricing. And if you find it easy to read those books, yes, it's because of two elements. The first is the structure of the book, but easily the biggest other factor is the sheer volume of stories and analogies, because it helps you understand the concepts better. It helps you understand the concepts more permanently. However, there is more than one way to skin a cat. The method that we looked at was the factor of disagreement. That was the second method. And the way to go about disagreeing with your headline or with your premise is to create the opposite effect. So if you say how to buy a secondhand computer that will last six years, then you go in the opposite direction. You tell the reader a story about computers that failed. When you go in the opposite direction, you do what DDB did with their Volkswagen Beetle advertising. And this method of disagreement, it gets a lot of attention. Finally, we get to the third way, which is creating lists. The list method is the easiest of all. For instance, if I wanted to start an article with a list, say this article, if I wanted to start it with a list, I could start with three points, which we have already covered. They are the power of the story, disagreeing with your premise, and finally, lists. So as they sat there as bullet points, the reader would get curious enough to want to read more. Then I could continue the article by simply explaining each of the points and fleshing them out in detail. But where should you start? What is the one thing that you can do today? If you're stuck with time, try the list today. But ideally, the best thing you can do for the long run is to fire up your copy of Evernote. Start saving stories. Go to BBC Earth. Go to History.com, Listverse.com, Smithsonian.com. Start saving those stories. There is nothing more powerful than stories, especially when you're starting up the first 50 words. And that brings us to the end of this episode. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? Last week was interesting because both of us, Renuka and I, seemed to lose our Fitbit. So it started with Renuka. She lost her Fitbit and then... A week later, I was putting the Fitbit in my pocket and I thought, I shouldn't be putting it in this pocket because I have the phone in this pocket and it's going to fall out somewhere. Sure enough, it fell out and as we found out later, it was at the cafe. So I've got my Fitbit back and she's got hers back. So what's the point of the story? Well, other than you knowing that we both lost Fitbits and we're helping Fitbit sell more products, it's amazing what happens when you don't have someone or something motivating you. And what we've done recently in 5000 BC, which is the membership site, is we've put in a system of tagging, pretty much like you've seen on Facebook. And on Facebook, it can be a pain sometimes, but in 5000 BC, where it's a much smaller space, it's been quite useful because as someone is talking about someone else, they can tag them and then the other person gets an email. And that works like a Fitbit. It gets the other person back in the conversation and we have the community going. Now, the community is already going, but that's what it got me to think about. It's like, if you don't have someone helping you out, then it's very hard to keep going no matter who you are. Most of us think that we don't need to ask for help, but all of us need the help. And using this Fitbit analogy works for 5000 BC, but it works for life as well.
So one person is checking up on the other person and it just makes this community grow. It makes the community safe. And that's approximately what the social capital, you know, the little headline that we ran earlier before in this episode, that's what social capital is. When you trust other people, then you tend to like your life better. They tend to like their lives better. The whole community becomes better. And that's what we've been aspiring for in 5000 BC for the last 13 years. So it's unlike any community. And I would invite you to join it because, first of all, it's a great place to ask your questions. And it's only once you get to 5000 BC that you realize it's a completely different place on the internet. There is almost no place that is as kind and helpful. And of course, I'm there like 20, 25 times a day, except on vacation. And I will be going on vacation in about four weeks from now and we'll be closed for about 20 days. No, not 20 days, 30 days. So you'll get some older episodes that, that were really popular. But that's where we are with Psychotactics Land. Other than that, we've got the first 50 words course and that's starting up in March. But we do have all those details on psychotactics.com slash 50x. That's psychotactics.com slash 50x. However, on December the 10th, that's when we're pre-selling it. So there are only 25 seats. As you know, with Psychotactics, the 25 seats go really quickly. I mean so quickly that sometimes it's not even a few hours, sometimes just minutes. The thing about writing articles or webinars or podcasts or anything is just this, how do I start? And that's what the first 50 words was designed to do. It was designed to get you to start your article with this gusto, with this tempo, with this ability to hold your customer's attention, especially today with all that noise around you. So that's the first 50 words course psychotactics.com slash 50x and that's me from psychotactics land saying bye for now bye bye